Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's my absolute privilege to stand here today with you. My name is Gina Pickering, and um, I'm looking forward to introducing you to some of the work that has been inspired by the life of Fanny Balbuck Uriel. She's a Swan River woman who happened to live through colonisation. And today it's my pleasure to uh, present for the first time, a premiere if you like, of a documentary that features seven Perth elder women who give some extraordinary insights into the life of Fanny Balbuck Uriel. And the National Trust and our partners and supported by Lottery West look forward to sharing with you a new publication, a new free publication, um, about this extraordinary resistance fighter who is from the Perth area. But first today, I would like to introduce to you Elder Marie Taylor. Marie features very strongly in this production and she has also played an essential role in guiding this project from the beginning as one of the members of the guiding committee. So Marie will um, present the welcome today. Thanks, Marie. Thank you very much, Gina. And uh, let me say that it's been my pleasure to be part of a project um, where during the project I found out that this lady is one of my grandmothers. And um, um, it's a very special honour to stand up, not try to step into her shoes, but to stand behind her, knowing that she has left her mark and her story on our country in a very special way. And let me say, as the Noongar Elder, Gina, it has been a pleasure working with you and with National Trust and all those who helped fund it and also with Irene, thank you. But let me welcome you to Noongar country. You have uh, come to sit, camp, listen, look and talk today on the most ancient of Aboriginal land in the world. And let me welcome you in the ancient language of Noongar. Abba, Wajak Baladong, Noongar Buri, Yok, Wanju Wanju, Noongars, Noongar Wom, Wajalas, Buriyas, Kulung. Ngang Jurup and Nunuk Nyining, Noongar Borja. Nietzsche Wadang met management Kundam Borja, Murk Jenabiri, Nietzsche Balabin Wil, Mit Nyining, Nalakan Yayi, Ni. Karajinang Kura, Yayi, Buddha. Greetings, the Aboriginal custodian welcomes all people here to the land of the people of many breast, the Bibbulmun country. We are on crow and cockatoo dreaming land, whose families and ancestors tread the grounds, leaving footprints upon the land, where their spirit lingers on, surrounding us through stories as we listen, look, learn and talk, like my people did in the past, we are doing so today and we will continue in the future. Nunakan Kulin Kumbawadan Pokicha, Alijanuna Boja, Yuwal Kulnicha, Yalagonga, Mijiguru, Mundi, Fanny Balbuck's Kalip, Nanjurupan, Nunak Nyining Nicha, Nalakan Kalip. Some of you may have come from over the great sea or from your lands afar to come and settle on the camping grounds of the elders' camping grounds. I warmly welcome you to our camping grounds of the past, here in the present, and also in the future. Yunka, thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. Well, this uh, project emerged almost a year ago now, and um, there are some people I'd like to acknowledge today that have made um, not only the project possible, but the experience quite an extraordinary one. So I'd, I'd like to um, thank Irene Stainton, who's with us today. It's very hard to get Irene at anything, really, because she's always on a plane somewhere. 
I range the chair of the Aboriginal Advisory Committee for the National Trust of Western Australia. Marie, who you've met, and Diane Yepo, who couldn't be here today. I don't think Diane's here today. Um, those three women uh, comprise the, the guiding committee for this project, so they played a really important role in making sure that this could keep going forward. I'd also like to thank the elders who have participated in this for their incredible enthusiasm. And it's always uh, a privilege to spend time with them um, and to listen to them. And um, we wouldn't have anything without the elders. The WA Inspired Art Quilters um, are here in a bit of a contingent today as well. And uh, these women have um, put together a magnificent response to Fanny Balbuck Gurel's life in Balbuck's country, which is um, being exhibited downstairs if you haven't seen it. Some people with um, extraordinary, outstanding uh, professional expertise that have played a key role in this, as well as their organisations, just need to be acknowledged too, because they've committed their, their time and their, their thinking and also their, uh, their finances to this. So Professor Susan Broomhall, who's from the Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions, um, her capacity to welcome ideas kindly is, is um, always um, a very positive thing. Um, there has also been aspects of her work that enable uh, a project like this to be delivered into the community as well as into academia. So that's a very important role too. Um, Mark Chambers from the Department of Aboriginal Affairs is an extraordinary researcher and his uh, commitment to, uh, to research and finding things, and I'll show you some of those things today, um, has, been, has been outstanding and he has a great understanding of the State Records Office and the, the records that exist, thousands and thousands of records that exist. I'd also like to thank my colleague Jenna Lynch, who's from the City of Perth, and Jenna and I have been working really closely together and it's been an ab absolute pleasure to do that, um, to make things come together, uh, including today, including um, the walk, including the um, exhibit downstairs. So there's some, some key people there. So look, a, a brief outline. With the theme having a voice, the 27 Australian Heritage Festival is marking the 50th anniversary of the referendum uh, that voted in favour of recognising Aboriginal people in the census. Supported generously by Lottery West, the National Trust of Western Australia invited Perth's Noongar elders to share their knowledge and understanding of local woman, Fanny balbuck -Uriel. She was a traditional Swan River woman, born around 1840, and she died on the 20th of March in 1907. So this is the 110th anniversary of her passing. The thing about Fanny is that there are varied accounts um, that offer really different understandings of her life. She's referred to as the last Swan River female native, but of course we know that's not true because there are Aboriginal people with us today who are still practicing their customs and culture on this land. Fanny Balbuck was an important woman in this area's first families. She was incredibly connected. Her grandfather was Yalagonga, her uncle was Yagan, her great uncle was Mijiguru. She had connections all around the Swan River and the Canning River. And there's documented evidence that many of her relatives are buried in the heart of the city. She has connections across the Swan River, um, out to Northam, to Balladong. Welcome. Balladong country, out to Northam, to Balladong country, and north to Ewood country around Geraldton. Her father, Kundabang, was a prisoner on Wajamup, on Rottnest Island, and he passed away there. The physician at the time, Dr. Crichton, suggested Kundabang had pined away for his wife and family, and his death prompted changes in the handling of prisoners on that island. 
Contemporary documents refer to her grandmother, Merjungal's burial at Government House Gardens, her other grandmother, Yaben, further west along St George's Terrace, a grandfather, Willia Willia, buried near the oldest jail in Perth, and her great uncle near the deanery, which is very close to where we are today. This is the only mark of Fanny that anyone's come across so far. That's quite, quite a poignant sort of feel when you see that. And, and, and trying to, I think, encounter her presence um, in this place, in the, in the city and through others, um, comes in varied and surprising forms. So many believe Fanny Balbuck was born at Madagarup, so at Harrison Island. But there's also evidence that she was born further east in the Middle Swan area. And, and this document's actually from um, some of the Daisy Bates archives. And aside from the incredibly disturbing first one liner up, up the top about her husband's mother, this also talks about Balbuck was born at Hooper's, Harris's, Leonard's place on Mr Moore's run. And over time, of course, places change shape and Many of those properties changed shape and were owned by different people. But these are some of the clues that we, that we find along the way. Fanny Bulbuck resisted the relentless changes to her homelands, which pre prevented her collecting food and having easy access to her land and simply living her life. Um, one of the key places that she collected food, her supermarket, if you like, was where Lake Kingsford was. Well, Lake Kingsford it now is um, in front of where the Perth Railway Station is. But when you have a look at this, this image, which is 1881, you can see how the landscape was changed. If that had been, that had been a rich lake with lots of creatures, lots of flora and lots of food. And that's how, that's how it transitioned. She's known for her strong actions and high profile amongst both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. She's also she's known for protesting at the gates of Government House and for knocking down palings, fence palings, with her wanna stick. This image is um, 1890s Perth and the central, um, the central road uh, that you can see there is Barrack Street heading up to, um, to Beaufort Street, just to give you a bit of a perspective. Her knowledge of Wajak country, recorded by Daisy Bates in the early 1900s, informed the successful Noongar native title claim of 2006, which upheld native title determination in the Perth metropolitan area. But Fanny Balbuck's life also <clears throat> highlights difficulties in getting to know Perth's original women. And we encounter Incomplete documents, second-hand accounts of her life, newspaper reports, police occurrence books, the courts, and some diaries. And I thought I'd just show you because we just don't usually get to see some of these um, these things. Um, that how she how she appears in this case, she appears here. So in this case, she often just appears as Fanny or Fanny, Aboriginal native. And in this case, she was a witness in the Supreme Court criminal sittings. This is um, a game from the Daisy Bates archives. And this is the letter to her son, Joe Donnelly. And she says, dear son, I'm glad to know that you got my letter at last and to know you are alive and well. When will you come down to see me? I hope you will come while I am alive. It won't be any good bringing me money when I've gone to Coronup. And my understanding of Coronup is that's where you go when you pass away, Marie, is that correct? Yeah. So these are very personal things. And in, we, we also start to just get a bit of a feel for what Fanny was, was like. Um, in this case, Daisy Bates has been her scribe. Here's another one. This one's um, a charge sheet where she's the offence is being drunk and disorderly. 
this one here, the admissions and discharges, is when she came into the Royal Perth, Perth Hospital at the end of her life. She was in that hospital for three days. Again, Fanny Welshpool Cannington. When she was at Welshpool, these were the people that she was living with. This was the Welshpool Native Reserve. So it's not a lot of people, and Daisy Bates is actually on the right-hand side there. When we looked at this photo, we wondered, is Fanny in there? Well, why wouldn't she be in there? And so the best that I could come up with was perhaps this was Fanny Bulbuck. There are only two photos that we know that exist at the State Library. That's the, the one on the left in the, in the white shirt. So that's the lady with the hat who's, who's in that broader group. In 2017, Fanny Bulbuck Uriel is a Wajak woman who is capturing the imagination of a lot of people in Perth. Her life has inspired the creation of a beautiful exhibition of quilts, a new map, which is something that you can all have a go of when you've got a little bit of spare time in the city. Um, it's created a new walk, uh, which was a beautiful experience to go on with Marie. We're going to be doing uh, an academic symposium on the 17th and also we've produced the publication. All these things are giving voice, I think, to Fanny Balbuck, but also to the elder women of Perth. And we haven't heard enough from either of those groups of people. Marie, could you please come up and give a perspective? <coughs> Thank you, Gina. And I know that there is a lot of stuff that you're going to um, um, watch in a moment when the DVD's on. But what I want to do is I want to highlight some other areas of Fanny. Everybody talks about Fanny and says she was a troublemaker. Well, I stepped out of that critical um, um, thought process and looked at her as a, as a woman within her country. How did she live? How did she treat people? And how did she relate to the law of the day? And in going back through um, Daisy Bates's book, I highlighted some stuff. One of the things that Fanny was, she was a businesswoman. She owned a Rilji site. And if anybody wanted Rilji from that site, they had to pay her for it. She was a businesswoman. And Rilji sites in the metropolitan area are very hard to come by. The other thing that she did was babysit. And being the oldest of 10 children, I know what that would have been like, but she got paid for it because she made friends with the people who had little children and they paid her to be their children's friend, which meant she was a worker. She was also not only a worker, but she was a teacher. She used to teach the white people about her community, about her knowledge of her Noongar culture, and tell them of the stories, the lore, L-O-R-E, that she knew about that she sat at the, when she sat at the feet of the elders who taught her, she was able to expand that knowledge to the non-Aboriginal community. She was a hunter and a gatherer. And like Gina alluded to before, she knew where her hunting grounds were. And it broke her heart to come back in later years to find her hunting grounds 
or filled in. Her totem as a female was war, the kangaroo female. She never ever broke the law relating to her food totem. She kept the law and in later years she had to learn the non-Aboriginal law. Could you imagine this, this woman who people assumed was uneducated but who was able to address the two laws? She knew how to work the system. She knew that her friends would help her out. But sadly, it was the maintaining of the law that sent her running from Wajak country, where she went away for seven years before she was allowed to come back to her lands. She was a storyteller. One of my favourite things is to tell stories. And I could just imagine that sitting at the feet of Fanny would have been a highlight for any young child, and especially for Daisy Bates, who wrote down the stories that she told. And many of them are in this book that I have. She was a historian. She knew her history. She knew what she could do with that history and she did it. As a result of it, many of her stories are in this book and are being expanded on today. Her knowledge of both the Aboriginal law and the non-Aboriginal law ensured that she was looked after by both sets of people. She also knew her ancestry. And if you look at the ancestry of Fanny Balbeck, it's probably one of the purest here in Wajak country, and also one of the biggest. And I'm proud to be part of that ancestry. Today we are looking at her story. Her voice is being spread through Wajak country, through stories, through the beautiful quilts that these ladies have sewn and opened up the knowledge on this lady who many people called a mischievous old woman. But when you look at those quilts and you see this story threaded through her country, you could just imagine her taking the steps and walking, leaving the footprints that these ladies have so beautifully sewn and are encaptured in material hanging down in the library. Her story came to an end and she cried, I want to die on my own land. Please take me back to my country. I know exactly how she felt. And, and, and family members brought her home so she could die. And she took her last breath over at Royal Perth Hospital. And in Noongar, it was written, Gordandrel Winjow, which means her heart has ceased to beat. And these words were uttered by her old relative when he heard of her death. Her hut and few animals and fowls which she had so fitfully attended in life are now Bindari, ownerless. 
and being so, are carefully looked after, for anything Bindari is an object of pity to everyone around. Fanny Balbeck has gone through the sea to Jinjan Janakurunup, the place where all natives go when they die. And she is there sleeping, but her story still lives on through this project, through the beautiful quilts that have been sewn, through this book that has been developed and presented, and also through a, through a DVD that is going to be shown in a minute. As a woman, I look at this lady and I think, We couldn't have had a better mentor for us women because women on Noongar country are sometimes forgotten about. But maybe today, because of this lady's voice and her story, the women who camp and sit and walk and work on Noongar country will also be heard in the future. Yunka, thank you. I've only seen photos of her up to probably about her waistline, um, but she comes across as a very strong character in her photos, and I would imagine that she was rather a tall woman. She was very strong, and um, she was outspoken. She was brave, yeah. She was strong, all right. She was born here. Her uh, mother and father occupied this place. Her grandfather, Yalagonga, they occupied this place. I would have liked to meet her. <laughs> yeah, because, um, you know, I'm not a person who's very outspoken like she is. She was. I think she is a forgotten lady and uh, why I like to think that she's getting recognised at last is because she is a very inspiring person to me. I would really have loved to have met her because her character was was much stronger than us women now today. And she is a great, great woman. She courageously stood up and 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 not fought as we know how to fight, but, but stood up in ways that made people um, um, call her a troublemaker, when in fact she wasn't a troublemaker. She was actually a female warrior for her people. Sadly, she found so much changes here that she couldn't accept it. You know, she would uh, walk through people's um, cottages, kicking doors down. And, uh, but the one thing that saved her from being put in jail um, was her friendship with these white people that she had made many years before as a, as a child. Admittedly, um, the Noongar people of this city was the most affected people in this state um, by colonisation. And I think um, she's a shining light in my eyes 
um, because she she knew where she had to walk, and if a gate was there, she opened it and walked through it. And if a house was stuck in a road, she went through that as well. She walked around the uh, country countryside here and done a lot of uh, argumentative things with people and, yeah, things like that, knocking fences down and going through gates and whatnot. Because she was frisky. She was a cat. <laughs> you know, a black cat. To me, I, that's the way I talk. And she wants to be friends with everybody. You know, her cat purrs on your legs and wants you to tap it and be nice. And a lot of the pioneers in them days were her friends. So I'm talking about Bulbuck. To some women, she could have been violent. It's what we read about her. She could have been violent, I don't know. And I can't say she was, because I never met her. Annie Bulbuck was related to Jagan and Mishri Gu. So <clears throat> strong men like that would have gave her the strength to be strong and to be outspoken. And she wasn't afraid because she'd seen the strength in them. So she knew she had to stand up and be, be strong for the women and to be an example for the young people to follow. Bulbuck had a lot of friends in Perth. She worked for uh, um, Cat Padbury, Walter Padbury, as a shepherd. And she said, this is my country. Yalagonga did not sell this country, but he said, we'll share it. Your country is my country. My country is your country. We share this country which did not happen. I tried to put myself in her shoes um, many times, and I think I would be frustrated too if I knew I was able to do something, and then all of a sudden it was everything was shut off from me, and I couldn't have that freedom to do what I used to do. But for me, the thing that stood out the most was um, how she could make friends with people like uh, this, uh, Millie Shenton, for instance. Um, uh, and during that time, to be a child, uh, when the white man came here and, and was literally um, pushing the Noongars off the land, um, sh she wouldn't have been able to um, see that uh, it was a time of, um, of turmoil for her people, uh, being a child at that time. She resisted a lot of their, their way of life, but she did got accustomed to beer. She was an alcoholic. <laughs> Maybe after a day's work, they'd give her a bottle, a bottle of beer or a bottle of wine, but she did become an alcoholic. Bulbuck did. To my understanding and knowledge of uh, what I've heard in, in the family history and stories, that uh, she's been a very uh, strong um, fighter in, our, in those days. I think she would have done well back here now. <laughs> and let's be honest, all of us women can be mischievous at times. And, uh, and I think that that was part of her way of letting off steam, perhaps, to, um, um, to be mischievous uh, within the community. And I think she had a right to do that as well, because she lived in a time that, that on one hand, she was Aboriginal, but on the other hand, she was supposed to be white, and she was being taught the white man's way to live, to, to um, follow their law. And that would have been a huge, um, mind-blowing concept at that time, to, to forget about your culture and to walk in this culture, heavens above. She's done some mighty things in her life. My grandmother was born in 1833 and she was born here and she told me that it, they were very careful because the, the troopers would shoot them and kill them. So Fanny Volbach was very brave and uh, she was brave to go where she went and, and told him off where she went.
where a lot of grandmother and her people were, well, they all were Wadjak people from the same tribe. But uh, my grandmother was, uh, said they were very frightened of the European people though, because the troopers were shooting them and killing them. And they call it niggers. Danny Bolbuck or Tolbuck was no different than my mother when her children was taken away. She was lost. She had no home. Her home was under a, a bush, a wattle tree, a gum tree. That was her home. There was um, uh, trees being cut down. Um, there were strange animals being brought here and let run through the bush that damaged the bush that um, probably um, turned upside down her totemic areas. And, and down here on Wajak country, the, the male totem is the kangaroo, uh, Yonga, and the female kangaroo is war. And, and she would have um, found the changes to them being removed from her community devastating. I think she would have had a proper go at them if she had the chance to, you know. Um, uh, it was sad to see that because uh, when you think about the land, the majority of us has been pushed off the land for not just here in Perth, across the nation. And uh, with Granny's... Uh, um, her life, she was pushed around as um, not weren't allowed to go th on her same pathways every day to wherever she wanted to go. Well, I can't do nothing about it now, but at that time, you know, it, if they knew the people should not have built a building on that, um, the Aboriginal people that was buried there. I guess she was shocked, and she couldn't stop it, and that made her angry. Um, she did go away for some time, and um, when she came back, she was shocked to see all these tents put up by the European people. And um, she started to get really angry, and I read one part where she went through someone's house, just walked in without, you know, telling them off. And she used to go over the back of the hill here to, um, to the lakes on the other side because that's where she used to get the gilgies and, and, you know, duck eggs and ducks and stuff like that for her. And that was her, her food. And uh, she had no one to sort of uh, um, get her food for her, so she had to get it herself. And every day she done that because of no fridge. No, we didn't have fridges in those days, so things used to be killed and hung up or cooked straight away and used straight away. She also knew about which food she could eat and she couldn't eat. She also knew about um, which animals she was allowed to kill. And, and one of the little animals that she was not allowed to kill was the little baby lizard, because that's our little brother. We used to go to the government house and sit down there for a while and... and Later on in later on in life, I learnt that my great great grandmother was buried there underneath government house. She lived among colonisation. She worked for them. She was a shepherd for Walter Pedbury, for someone who didn't have a car, didn't have a horse and cart. Um, she certainly moved around the countryside. Um, and how she got from A to B, I don't know. It probably was horse and cart, I suppose. She knew every rock hole. She knew every stream. She knew every sacred site where it was. And that stuff that um, um, was taught to her as a little girl. And you don't forget things when it's taught to you when you're small. To me, myself and my family, my children and grandchildren, I think that it's very important for us to know her and, and to read about her and the things, but I just know what my grandmother told me. Um, that, but he, she didn't say much, but she told me 
her run was around in the Swan River. I think when when she left Perth and went to Northam, her life up there wasn't that good. Um, I know she got into some altercations up there with family members. Um, and then that prompted her to move over to Durian Bay. Somebody who can, can do that has to be admired because um, the law, well, the law is the law. And if you break the law, you could either end up in jail or you could end up dead. And that's how it was in her day. And, and people don't realise that Aboriginal law is a lot, a lot stricter than what white law is today. She would have had pride in her land and pride in herself and her people. She had a quality that during that time is not highlighted among many women. And that was the, the uh, ability to make friends with the white people. Bulbuck, history said she had one son who went north and passed on. A lot of people didn't actually like her because of her boisterous ways and her life, you know, because she was a person who would um, go up against a lot of people because she, they were in her pathway and things like that, you know, and wanted to take over her land, as she put it, as we all put it. Why well, I'm also proud of my acknowledgement of her is because through my children, who are Yappos, and if you look at the family tree, there's an old man Yappo in it, and they go right, you look at the indigenous, the Yappos, um, that go right back um, um, to her. Um, so that's what I'm so happy, to be a mother of Yappo children um, and to give them some acknowledgement and some recognition um, through this um, lady. So she didn't only live in Perth, she lived in Northam and then she eventually went into our country and knew it as far as Durian Bay is, from what I can gather. She was an old feisty lady, yes, very feisty. I think her courage uh, to have stood up um, for her people as well um, uh, would have um, uh, made her um, uh, be respected by those out in the community, both the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal community, uh, because that's what you needed during that time. You needed courage. Uh, to, to, to continue to be the Aboriginal person on your land. Daisy Bates came out of England to write the last of the Aboriginal people. But in her diary, in her self-diary, she said, if I only could tell the truth. That, to me, that means a lot. It means a lot. Who was right and who was wrong? And my cousin, um, um, Mr Pickett, you might know Fred Pickett. Mm. He, he's a very strong person who had a, a great, great knowledge of her. And he used to tell me about her. And that's where I got it from. I think that um, based on her extraordinary knowledge of her uh, Aboriginal land, her Aboriginal community, her Aboriginal people. She knew the law. And he, he said to me, did you, did you know about Grandma? You know, and I said, Grandma, I said, no, I've never met your family. And that this is I'm thinking about, he was talking about his mother's mother or his father's mother. But it was the old granny, back way back, who was the grandmother of, of the whole old tribe. Yeah. And I said, um, no, I haven't. And he said, and he sat me down and we talked about it and, and told me the story. And I said, oh, gee, that's, that's fascinating. Had she have, um, stayed in her own country, she would have been speared and then she would have had to go uh, through white man's jail. And so it was her decision to leave her, her people's country and go away for those seven years. And that took courage. And, and to me, uh, that shows um, that if a woman can do that, um, back in the days when, when life would have been so difficult, um, 
um, to have been able to do that and, and go forward as an Aboriginal woman, she, she's to be respected. She'll be the first one from that era um, to have this recognition. Um, um, you know, we've got a lot of women that could be acknowledged. I read about it in the book, but sometimes we don't know if that is true in the book. As the people see her, they say that she is angry. She's an angry lady, but our ourself, we, we don't believe in those sorts of things, you know. Oh, that's my grandmother. She is not like that. But I don't know what she was like and what Daisy Bates wrote about her. I don't know if that is true. It was her um, knowledge of the law that um, she was most strict about for herself personally. She wasn't afraid to tell somebody off if they broke the law. And, and she wasn't afraid to uh, accept retribution if she broke the law. The stories I get told by family is, is my uh, better knowledge, yeah, from family members. And that's how I believe it better. People are now starting to recognise the female uh, place within the community. And as a result of it, um, being able to read about Fanny Bulbate, uh, read her story, um, read how, how her uh, in-depth knowledge of her community um, ha has been highlighted by some of our writers, such as Daisy Bates. She lived up in the hills, Mamba. But she lived there with um, Jubich. Jubich was her uncle. And the, her other, and the other last of the natives. But the children were all taken to Nunausia. Even Jubich's children were taken to Nunausia. Even Kayanga's children were taken to Nunausia. And so most of the children were handed over to Salvata for protection and to learn the English way of life. Well, I feel really bad for that because I was brought up on a reserve too, you know, in Northern, and um, we just lived in camps and things. And, and uh, for her, would what the white people say that she was, a, you know, had knowledge, for her to end up in the Reserve is very sad. Because she was sort of taken away from where she lived and where she held her part of the land where she loved, you know. And uh, a lot of our old people, if they're taken away from their birthright place, they uh, intend to dwindle and, and uh, don't live very long. They like to stay on their own ground where they were born. As soon as we pass, we want to go back home and be buried. And that's probably one of the reasons that she came back to Welshpool, where there was, I don't know how big Welshpool Reserve was, um, but she probably found some comfort um, coming back there among some people that she may have known. Well, for me, it's around ensuring that the stories about women are treasured. For many years we've had stories about our men folk. You look at, uh, as an example, stories around Yagan and the work that he was doing in trying to bring the new settlers to this country together with the traditional owners. But we haven't had the same sorts of stories around our heroic women who did many of the same sorts of things and I think it's time to do that. I think it's very important to... Um, um know all about uh, old Granny Fanny uh, because she was, uh, she was a great matriarch within her family back then and uh, even though we're a much younger generation here, we still think of her as, as, as a, a living person really um, because she was always a, a hero in our eyes, for us women that is. I think 
The biggest benefit that we can learn from Fanny is the fact that she got on with both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And if you can do that in today's world, then you've won my respect. And that's what Fanny did back then. She, she, she won the respect and the friendship uh, because um, she worked with both sides of the people, the white and the Aboriginal. And it's not only her own family, but also the Aboriginal communities on the outskirts of Noongar country where, where she was banned to. Well, to Aboriginal men, women was under them. The Aboriginal men were the leaders. And, you know, they have meetings and everything had to go through them. The women were just workers. You know, the women had to do all the work. Well, let's say the world is dominated by men um, and even our own men. Um, they think that men have to be um, above women, um, but that's not in my case. I don't believe so because the men were hunters and gatherers and it was a woman that kept the family going. And if you educate a community, you educate it through a woman. Um, so I don't think that there is enough of us acknowledging our Aboriginal women. A lot of people are starting to realise that um, uh, Wajak Noongar country is matrilineal and it's a women's country. And, and the women's um, uh, are the brilliars of this country. To know that uh, we had a great granny, great great granny that was very strong in here in the city, living here long before the tall, tall buildings was put up and things <laughs> like that. You know. To us as Nunga women, um, she's um, we've all got a soft spot for for her as a woman. Um, and she's certainly admired among my community, where I come from, in Ewart. Um, so I suppose that's the difference. We've known about her all our lives um, while we were growing up. And then with the non-Aboriginal people, they'll just become to get to know a story about a woman, um, whether it's her or another Aboriginal woman, but particularly about her and her struggles of survival especially here in the metro area. I think Fanny Bolbuck had people like her in her life would help her. She wouldn't have lived so long, wouldn't she?